We expected hardships when we started out, but nothing like what we encountered. There were no conditions of weather that we did not endure, no topographical obstacle we did not overcome. We wheeled across mountains, through sand hills, and over hard and muddy roads. The trip to my thinking established the bicycle's place in military tactics. Lieutenant James Moss, St. Louis Dispatch, July 28, 1897. What they achieved was monumental. And I was really surprised that history did not give them the rightful place in the discussion of that effort. Because for African Americans especially, it was a trip value of making that part of the history books, we believe. Lieutenant James A. Moss and this Army on Wheels captured the imagination of Americans during the summer of 1897. These Buffalo soldiers took part in a great bicycle experiment conducted by the United States Army. They would ride their bikes nearly 1,900 miles from Fort Missoula, Montana to St. Louis, Missouri. The men would be known as the Bicycle Corps. And when asked what are they doing, they would say, we're following the lieutenant. Missoula, Montana is located in the northwest of the United States. In the 1890s, the American West's population was small, and Montana was considered far away from the populated East Coast. Fort Missoula rests in the center of five valleys nestled along the Bitterroot River. It was at this military outpost that Lieutenant Moss would dream up the idea of putting soldiers on bicycles. He would find volunteers from the 25th Infantry. During this time in American history, People in the West and North were more accepting of African Americans and black soldiers, who the Native Americans called Buffalo Soldiers. The black soldiers had black curly hair, and to the Indians, it looked like buffalo fur. And so the Indians really referred to them as, as Buffalo Soldiers. But also in Montana, uh, in their winter coats were made out of buffalo hide with buffalo gloves and and leggings and everything. So they were almost entirely encased in buffalo hides in the wintertime. And to the Indians, they looked like buffalo. I think it was in 1972 or three, I started doing research after I came across the famous picture of the 19 of them. And I thought it was incredible. And I spent the next year or so doing research on their trip. Lieutenant James Moss graduated last in his class from West Point. So he got the worst possible assignment that the, that the Army could, could give him. That's in western Montana, out in nowhere, and in command or assigned to a black Army unit. It doesn't get much worse than that in the 1880s military. He made the best out of it command enjoyed the way he worked with the soldiers. He respected the soldiers. The soldiers respected him. He's got to do something to further his career. He thought that bicycles could replace horses in terms of transportation for soldiers. And he wanted to prove that the bicycles could be used in a wide variety of terrain and weather conditions. The latter part of the 1800s, Asiatic as well as European countries were beginning to test the bicycle and use them for military purposes. So the idea kind of caught on with him because he was a bicycle enthusiast. It's hard to believe today, but the bicycle was the most technological advanced product of its time. We think of today as it's a bike. But back then, this was incredible. So whoever had the bicycle has a step up. And his idea of using the bicycle were, for many reasons, some of which you can't track a bicycle. You don't know if it's coming or going. You don't have to feed a bicycle. You can hide the bicycle easier than you can a horse because it, obviously a bike is still. Moss threw himself into the project, believing it would help boost his career. He would need help if his idea of an army on wheels was going to take root. General Nelson Miles was an imaginative and creative leader in the United States Army. During his military career, he crossed paths with General Custer, 
Sitting Bull, Chief Joseph, and Geronimo. Miles was involved in conflicts that molded the West. By this time, he's in charge of the entire army, and he has always been a forward-thinking man. So he's seeing in the bicycle a way to combine a number of different things that will improve life for the army. With General Miles' blessing, Moss formed his first bicycle corps in the summer of 1896. His plan was to test out the bicycle and men on two shorter trips that summer before embarking on a longer journey in 1897. The average weight of the bicycle fully loaded was something like 54, 56 pounds or something like that. So that was a pretty heavily burdened uh, weight for the bicyclists during that period of time. Well, the trip to Lake McDonald was undertaken by Moss and eight men. That was his training unit. It was four days, two days to, two days back. And they made great progress. What was going to plague them emerged very early, and that was the weather. And that was going to be the plague for the experiment. Moss, believing the results of the trip to Lake McDonald were positive, asked for and received permission to conduct a longer test ride. This time, Moss and the soldiers would ride to Yellowstone Park and back. The trip took them nine days. So they had you know, some really great runs, and then they had some miserable treks with rain and the wind and the dust. The climbing and go, going up and down the mountains, there are no trails. They're really you know, Indian trails, if anything. And some of them are very steep and rocky. So you can imagine going up those, you have to be pushing your bicycle up, putting the brakes on, pulling yourself up, pushing it up again, and then down the same thing. Because you've got to keep control of your bike. So most of those, that was done by walking. They also had to take their bikes over the Continental Divide, which was a very arduous ride. They encountered lots of mosquitoes, lots of poor conditions. The roads were very, very poor, especially for bicycles. Certainly you see the photos of them on Minerva Terrace in, in Yellowstone. You know, they're getting, you know, to see Yellowstone as nobody gets to see it. This is something fun. They're trying to prove something to themselves, to white America, to the military. So they're going to put their all behind it. The soldiers had a chance encounter with Frederick Remington, a famous American artist. After breakfast, the march begins. A bicycle corps pulls out ahead. It is heavy wheeling and pretty bumpy on the grass, where they are compelled to ride, but they manage far better than one would anticipate. Frederick Remington. Remington never sketched or created a painting of the Bicycle Corps. Later, he would paint the famous charge up San Juan Hill that included Buffalo Soldiers. Moss considered the trip to Yellowstone a success and was eager for more. He began planning an epic 1,900-mile journey from Fort Missoula, Montana to St. Louis, Missouri. Moss took his idea up the military chain of command and was granted permission to conduct his great bicycle experiment in the summer of 1897. He wanted to make sure that the individuals that he chose for the bicycle corps were men of stature and men that would respect the opportunity and men that would follow instructions. Mingo Sanders was a longtime top sergeant. He was very valuable. The men all trusted him. The officers trusted him. He'd been in the Army at that point, going on 20 years or so. So he was the reliable, non-commissioned officer. Lieutenant Moss would talk to him about the day's events or tomorrow's events, and then he would relay that information on military fashion to the troops. Moss, he wanted to go and test the bicycle and the men on the bicycle over as many different types of terrain as possible. So looking around, he decided that the best test for that then would be from the mountainous area of western Montana down to the high plains, to the low plains, through the river valleys, on down to St. Louis. He wanted to choose a route 
that would give the men and the equipment a thorough test. To keep the men supplied and to keep down the amount of weight that each man had to carry, the idea was that the path would go along pretty much parallel the railroad tracks so that he could transport supplies to each railroad depot along the way. This way it keeps the weight down, keeps the supplies limited that you have to take, and it also encourages you to stay on schedule. Lieutenant Moss, 20 Buffalo Soldiers, and the regiment's assistant surgeon, James Kennedy, would leave on June 14th. Joining them would be a reporter from the Missoulian Edward Booth. Booth would file stories along the route and take photographs documenting the trip. Uh, the trip to St. Louis was in the New York Times and the St. Louis Dispatch, and literally papers all across the country were following his, his reports. The party left Fort Missoula on the morning of June 14th and has been marching ever since, its intention being to go to St. Louis and make the trip in six weeks and then make a return trip, the purpose of which is to demonstrate the utility of the bicycle in practical warfare. Billings Gazette, June 23rd. The trip of this little command will be watched with great interest, not only by the people of Montana, but by the whole United States for the reason that it will be a practical test of the utility of the bicycle for warfare in this country of rough and sandy roads and steep mountain ranges, as well as of its durability under any and all circumstances. Bozeman of Courier, June 26, 1897. The soldiers saw a bicycle corps as a way to kind of get away from the monotony of camp life. It was a way to do something extra they got to travel a little bit more. It was kind of an adventure. Uh, many of them didn't realize it was also going to be a hardship. I, ironically, when they left in June 1897 from Fort Missoula, it wasn't very far out of Missoula before the clouds came and it started to rain. And the roads, of course, that they used were either game trails or um, wagon trail roads that were full of ruts and they had a hard time riding through the ruts and the muck and oftentimes they had to walk and push or carry their bicycles because the gumbo mud was all the way up to the chain guard sometimes. Eventually to try to get out of some of this they walked or attempted to ride their bikes within the rail tracks themselves which was pretty monotonous and hurtful for the wrists. They were tired out and they had been fighting rain and mud for a couple of weeks. They get to uh, Wyoming and suddenly it's extremely hot, extremely dry. And they had probably not adequate food at that time. So it began to take a toll on the soldiers. Many of them had diarrhea, exhaustion, fevers. Some of the soldiers were forced to take their time. They didn't travel as one, necessarily one group. They would often be strung out for miles on the trail. At this point in time, even Moss reached the point of exhaustion and hallucinations. Mingle Sanders became Lieutenant Moss's right-hand man. He was a spiritual advisor, a father to the young troops. He was the one that motivated the troops when they were mentally or physically tired. I like to think of him as kind of the soul of the bicycle experiment. Moss is the brains and maybe the heart of it, but I think Sergeant Sanders was more like the soul. He represents the black man's experience. You've got Moss, who's you know, a lieutenant and destined for great things, perhaps. This is just you know, a, a black man doing the very best he can, and he's, he's gonna make sure everybody else does the best they can.
If they got spread out, he would go back and check on the bicyclists that had fallen behind to check on them and see how they were going. So he played all of those roles. And he was the disciplinarian as well if troops needed to be disciplined for any infractions. One day we rode for five hours on one egg and one piece of bread. There are plenty of chickens along the way, but you know, the army regulations are very strict. Unfortunately, they were burning so many calories that the food was probably inadequate. They were forbidden from foraging, as they called it. However, at least one occasion when a uh, landowner ran them off of his property, Moss gave orders that if there were uh, chickens suddenly appeared in the uh, pot for breakfast, he, he would consider it an act of providence, I believe. The next morning, uh, some chickens did miraculously appear for breakfast. During the trip, Private Eugene Jones began causing trouble for Lieutenant Moss. From day one, he really wasn't cut out to be a bicyclist and to take this 1,900-mile journey. And every day, he lagged behind to the point of them having to encourage him. Many of these soldiers became sick during the trip. And in Moss's opinion, Jones was kind of a malingerer. Moss did not feel that Jones was putting all his effort into this. And Jones complained he could not go, go any further. Moss thought Jones was just looking to be sent on a train trip to St. Louis. Eventually, Moss got tired of Jones and sent him back to Missoula instead. It's interesting that Jones would later be wounded in the Spanish-American War in Cuba, trying to take San Juan Hill. Bicycle groups would often come out and meet them on the road and ride along with them for miles or to the next town. There were a lot of, as Moss called them, country people who didn't appreciate bicyclists and they didn't appreciate black soldiers either. There were a few instances, I understand, where the townspeople did not like them, did not want them to rest on their property. Most of the times, they were welcomed. At the same time, they received a lot of acclaim and recognition from, from other people. A lot of townspeople were amazed to see what they were doing. Well, Moss had a theory that uh, the local road conditions kind of reflected the character of the people who lived there. And so when the roads were poor, he thought the people were uneducated and unhelpful to him. When the roads were good, he found that the people were generally more helpful, more friendly, a better quality of people was Moss's theory on that. Booz's reports for the Daily Missoulian were picked up by newspapers, not just all across the country, but even in Europe. People all along the route were anticipating the soldiers as they came through, and this became quite a big event for a lot of people who lived on these small towns. These people were coming through that they were kind of world famous almost by this time. The soldiers wheeled into St. Louis 41 days after leaving Missoula. They spent 34 days riding, walking, and pushing their bikes. They averaged 6.3 miles per hour and just over 55 miles a day. The trip proved beyond peradventure my contention that the bicycle has a place in modern warfare. In every kind of weather, over all sorts of roads, we averaged 50 miles a day. At the end of the journey, we are all in good physical condition. 17 tires and half a dozen frames is the sum of our damage. The practical result of the trip shows that an Army Bicycle Corps can travel twice as fast as cavalry or infantry under any conditions, and at one-third the cost and effort. Lieutenant James A. Moss. What they achieved was monumental. And I was really surprised that history did not give them the rightful place in the discussion of that effort. Because for, for African Americans especially, it was a trip value of making that part of the history books, we believe. Moss was very ambitious. He made a major report on his 
trip to St. Louis and proposed for the next year a trip to San Francisco. While Nelson Miles was quite enthusiastic about the Bicycle Corps, a lot of the Army brass was not all that enthused about it. His proposed trip came at a time when tensions were running high with Spain and the Spanish-American War was about to break out. When war finally did break out with Spain, the 25th Infantry was the first unit called up. They marched through downtown Missoula. Missoula threw them a great big farewell parade. They were the first unit to head to the south in preparation to going to war. In all my 36 years of service in the Army, I have never seen a more popular turnout to bid troops farewell, with the exception of the Civil War, than it was accorded us by the people of Missoula this morning. It made me feel proud, and I wish to express through your paper my thanks and hearty appreciation to the kind people of Missoula for the demonstration. Colonel Bert Missoulian, April 11th, 1898. The Spanish-American War was fought between the United States and Spain in 1898. Cubans were fighting for their independence from Spanish rule. The Battle of San Juan Hill was a turning point in the war. It was there that future President Theodore Roosevelt would fight alongside former members of the Bicycle Corps. When they arrived in Cuba, they were spread out for their assignments. They took part in the charge of San Juan Hill. And during that charge, Teddy Roosevelt was Colonel of the Rough Riders. And they played a significant part in the battle for El Canai. Teddy Roosevelt charged up the hill. They were side by side with him and arguably Roosevelt would not have succeeded. And when Remington does his very famous charge up San Juan Hill, if you look at it, there is one black man who was kind of like centered in it. It's kind of hidden until you see it, and then that's almost all that you see. And Roosevelt acknowledged what the black units had done for him in that battle, which makes, makes the later story even sadder. Well, the Brownsville affair occurred when these soldiers had spent 10 years in Montana and they'd endured some racial prejudice here. Then they'd gone to Cuba to fight in the Spanish-American War. Then they'd gone to the Philippines for three years. And when they came back, they were eventually assigned to Brownsville, Texas. So in 1906 in Brownsville, Texas, one evening a white citizen got shot and killed and there were race tensions along that whole period of time. The 25th Infantry was accused of shooting a white citizen. And some onlookers said that these were black soldiers who had been involved in this gunfight. A bartender was killed and a sheriff's officer was wounded, I believe. So they insisted these soldiers be arrested. And when the authorities went to determine who was responsible. All of the soldiers on the 25th Infantry said they had been in their barracks, their rifles were accounted for, the ammunition was accounted for, and they had nothing to do with this. The Army brass eventually, and this was under President Teddy Roosevelt at this time, decided these soldiers were covering up, and so they dismissed three companies. They were kicked out of the Army, their pensions were refused, they could no longer hold any civil service jobs. And one of these soldiers was Mingo Sanders, who had both helped Lieutenant Moss on the bicycle trip, but he had also helped Teddy Roosevelt in the Spanish-American War. And he lost his pension, lost his job, and these people were basically destitute. The Brownsville Affair destroyed Mingo Sanders. Mingo had spent 25 years in the military. He was getting very close to retirement. I think it was probably even within days of retirement. But when the Brownsville Affair erupted and the entire unit was dishonorably discharged, it destroyed him, just destroyed him. He appealed to a lot of his former officers who went to bat for him. This became a big political scandal. It's considered one of Teddy Roosevelt's worst mistakes. There was a widespread 
recognition that this was completely unfair. The saddest part of Roosevelt's legacy was the fact that he let that dishonorable discharge go through. He fought with these men and then he turns around and lets this criminal injustice happen. This was not rectified until the 1970s when President Nixon pardoned these soldiers and retroactively gave them an honorable discharge. But by that time, there were only two of them left alive. In the summer of 1974, Farron Doss and a black studies group from the University of Montana retraced the route of the Bicycle Corps. It was an honor to retrace the history, to feel physically and mentally what they went through. We would sit around the fire at night talking about what it must have felt like riding 50 or 60 miles during the day in the rain. All throughout the trip, it gave us a deep connection. We always wanted to know what it would be like to be one of the soldiers in 1897, what it was like to have ridden one of those original bicycles and to have ridden on those roads that were not what we're used to today. You know, some 45 years or so since we took the trip, you know, every once in a while I get this deja vu, especially when I sit down and look at the picture, and it takes me back in time. I dwell on what I would have done, what I would have been like in those days. And when I talk to my peers that took the trip, it's as though it was yesterday that we took the trip, and it was as though it was yesterday that we actually really talked because our minds just gel, go right back to that period of time. Lieutenant Moss would rise through the ranks up to Colonel. He would write a number of well-respected manuals and books and was a major force behind the creation of Flag Day. What the Bicycle Corps accomplished in the summer of 1897 was monumental and a story that history quietly forgot.